Let's do this if we can. Actually, I'm going to hold off reading that because I want to I'm going to hold off reading scripture today for a moment because let's let's stop for a moment. Let's build a, a, a picture here because I think it's important. Context, I always say context is king. In scripture, context is king. You can't understand anything without context, right? We always say if someone quotes us and they quote us wrong, one of the things we say, well, that was taken out of context. I, did you say it? Sure, I said it. Well, then you said it. Yeah, I said it, but that wasn't the context of what I said it in. Um, there's a lot of things that said within the right context can have one meaning, said in a different context that have a completely different meaning. So we don't know what the context is, especially silly example. But actually, we were talking about this the other day, off the, off the subject here, but the complications of the English language. Uh, that it's hard in, in English sometimes because English is so nuanced. For example, if I said there, there, there's three possibilities for the word there. There's T-H-E-R-E, -E, which means there, the location, T-H-E-I-R, which is uh, 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 like they're possessive. And then there is the abbreviation of they are, which is there, which is a whole nother meaning. I said all that because ultimately the context of that gives us the meaning. You won't know if it's T-H-E-R-E -E or T-H-E-I-R or T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E unless you know the context. So I've said, hey, go over there. I don't have to give you a breakdown. You know, because of the context, what word I'm using. If I said, they're so cool, you know that that's T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. Or if I said, uh, have you seen their jacket? You know what, there it is. Again, how do I know that? context, right? Context. Without context, if I said, give me the definition of the word there, you're going to go, which there? There's several situations in English language where you have this word that it's the same sound, but context gives it different meanings. And in some cases gives it different spellings. My mind is sort of, I'm sure some of you are better at Remembering more, I know there's more out there, but my mind is blank today, but there's a good example of that. So I say all that because in scripture, context is king. If you don't look at context, you can't get the meaning. You can take something out of scripture and you can create a context that you can create a completely different meaning than it was supposed to be because you get the wrong context. So anytime, this is a little bit of teaching for a moment. We're not going here today, but just to kind of always an opportunity. Uh, I love talking about this. And so it's an opportunity to always share this because it's so, it's so important. Anytime you're going to scripture, to, in order to get the, the, um, the full context, you have to, have to, uh, the f full meaning, you have to first look at context. And there's multiple contexts. There's historical context. There's cultural context. There's personal context. Uh, there's multiple things that deliver context. Uh, if I said to you right now, for example, if I said, man, I, our world is in absolute chaos, the context of that statement and the current state of our world, you will start to fill in the, the, the meaning of that. Because for example, in our world today, when you, so it's, we have inflation, we've got, you know, shootings happening. We've got, you know, political upheaval. We've got just bizarre, right? A lot of crazy things happening right now. Uh, so if I said our world is really in chaos, that's context, right? But if I said in 1941, the world's in chaos, well, to them, that meant th the world was at war. Countries were fighting each other. Millions of people were dying. So the context of history determines its meaning. I say all this because again, anytime we go to the scripture, we have to be careful of interpretation because interpretation is built upon context. I don't know why I'm saying this. I know I've talked about this before, but I just can't pass it up. It's, it's so important. Context is king. So what does that have to do with today? Well, let's look at some context. 
we're talking about love, right? We're talking about love. We've used Paul because Paul is such a powerful writer on love. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Paul, uh, we started with Jesus, Jesus giving us this command to love, um, uh, love one another as I have loved you. And then we talked about Paul because Paul gives us some application to how that's to be the case. Paul writes down a, a, a list of one another's. Paul talks about uh, all kinds of different concepts of love. And then Paul writes a, a beautiful descriptive uh, 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 understanding of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Paul was, was such a beautiful writer of love. But there's another person in the scripture that is equally as important when it comes to love. And I think his take on love, it puts it in a different perspective. And that is John. Now, John is unique. Again, this is context. And forgive me for just a moment here to get a little technical, but it's important because if you don't understand the context, you won't really see the magnitude of what's being said today. And that is simply this. John is unique because John writes four books. He writes the gospel of John, which is a part of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. He writes John, the Gospel of John. He also writes three letters, which we call epistles, which is 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. In these four books, he gives us such a beautiful picture of who Jesus is, but more importantly, who he is within the context of love. But even greater than that, the thing that makes John's letters and gospel so unique is the time at which it was written. Again, silly, but this is important. When we think of the gospels, we often think of sort of the biography of Jesus. That's not what they are. And we also think of the gospels as something that was written and then handed out sort of right there as Jesus ascended into heaven. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each turned around and started passing out their copy of Jesus's life. That's not the case. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written somewhere, scholars have estimated, around 30 years, 25, 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just think about that. So it's 2023. That means Jesus would have been resurrected in around 1990, and we're just starting to write a book about him. To give you some context there. Can you see the difference in context? 30, this is 30 years ago. So these events happened in 1990, 1993. We're just writing about them. All of a sudden that changes. But John's even more extreme. Most scholars believe that John didn't write anything until around 90, BC, 90 AD. So Jesus died around 30, 33. John comes out post 90, 60 plus years. So let's do our little book, a little math again. So now we're going back to 1963. We're going to write about events from 1963. Well, guess what? There's a lot of stuff that's happened between 1963 and 2023. In case you have been living under a rock, let me break it down for you. There's been a lot of cray cray in the last 60 years. Why is that important? Because when John writes things, he's writing from a different perspective than if he would have written them in 1963. If you would have wrote about the history of our world in 1963, you would have written something completely different than you write in 2023. COVID wouldn't have been in there. 9-11 wouldn't have been in there. There was a lot of things that would have been left out that have absolutely shaped our entire world. The cell phone wouldn't have been a part of that. The internet wouldn't have been a part of that. Television was there, but it wasn't controlling our lives like it is now. Computers were still pretty much sitting in a, a giant room in 1963. We hadn't even put a man on the moon. We thought the Russians were about to nuke us and we were all going to die and kids were doing um, uh, 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 nuclear bomb drills by crawling underneath their desk. Those of you that are old enough to do that. Crazy, right? We're going to have a nuclear bomb dropped on us that's going to melt everything in its path, but we're going to be saved by this wooden desk. So if 1963, you would have written a wholly different, complete understanding of the world than you do in 2023. But in 2023, if you write things that were true in 2023 and in 1963, there's a different context to that. So example, John is now writing in, in around 90 plus AD. 
Let's look at the context here. This is huge, right? Because it shapes, it should shape how we interpret what John says because John is not just writing poetically. John's not just writing out of his intellect. He's talking about something deeper here. So let's look at the context of John's writing. Number one, by this time, all of the main disciples are dead. They've been killed. They haven't just died naturally in a nursing home somewhere. They're dead. They've been crucified. They've been they've been thrown off buildings uh they've been stoned i mean they it's been bloody by this time around 90 a uh, 90 a.d nero has wreaked havoc nero being the roman emperor who brought severe persecution to the church he has wreaked havoc he's killed literally tens of thousands of of christians not just killed them but like beyond belief that the, the suffering, feeding them to wild beasts, burning them alive. Not, you know, no death is good, but, you know, a quick death is one thing, but to be burned alive at a stake or to be fed to wild beasts. So this has been happening. So tens of thousands of people are dead. All the disciples are dead. And on top of that, as a Jew, John is writing post-destruction of the temple. The temple, even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the church, the temple continued for over 40 years after Jesus' resurrection, about 40 years. Because the temple was destroyed in uh, early 70s, not 1970s, early 70s AD. And Jesus had predicted when the temple was destroyed, not one stone would be left. And literally, when the Roman, uh, when the Romans came through, they literally laid the temple bare, and thousands of Jews were slaughtered. In fact, one of the one of the accounts said that uh, that when the Romans finally they laid siege to Jerusalem, and basically starved the city out. It was horrible, right? They did. They were smart. They came to. This is just kind of a historical thing, but it's very fascinating in one sense. The Romans show up and Jews are coming back on pilgrimage, right? Because we know three times a year, all Jewish males were to return to Jerusalem for festivals. So they're coming back to Jerusalem. So the Romans were so kind to provide escort for them back to Jerusalem. And once they get them all in the city, then they lay siege to the city. And when you lay siege to the city, that means you start bombing the city like we would do today. It means you just, you choke out the city. You don't let any food in. And you don't let anybody out. And so you basically just make this, you just start to, to starve the city. Horrible way to go out, right? There's a part in, in the Old Testament where they did this to one city and people were so bad that they were starting to eat animals and eating their own children. That's how bad things had gotten when you lay siege to a city. Well, the Romans were doing this to Jerusalem. So finally, the city had gotten weak enough, they attacked the city and they start slaughtering. One account said there were so many dead bodies, you couldn't walk the street. You could walk, you could walk through Jerusalem without touching the ground, as one histor historical record said. You could watch, walk through Jerusalem without ever touching the ground. Why? Because there were that many dead bodies on the ground. This is the city in which, this is the holy city, right? And so as they laid siege, the priests and, uh, 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 and, and religious leaders went to the temple and they started praying and calling out to God, God save us, God save us, God save your house, God save your house. And the, the Romans uh, attacked the temple and killed and slaughtered the, the priests brutally. And in the context of that, didn't just destroy the temple, they, they just absolutely threw it to the ground. So this is, John has seen all this, he's heard all this. And he's writing these things at the end of his time. He's writing these things with the context. And this is how he's writing. Now, to me, when I know that, it completely puts a different context to his writing. Because he's not writing some beautiful, scripted, poetic, the world is peachy and perfect, marshmallows and 
cotton candy and you know, everything is just so wonderful and I'm just going to write about God because God's so good and everything's so beautiful and oh, I just can't stop loving Jesus because he's so good to me and I'm just blessed and highly favored and I'm sitting up here in my perfect world and my perfect house and I'm sitting here just with the blessings of God because the world can't touch me. No, this is a guy that's had dealt with tremendous sorrow. He had his own issues. He was, tr they tried to kill him by boiling him alive. He didn't cook. They put him on an island with criminals on an isolated island uh, of the of Isle of Patmos, he was he was isolated from everybody, taken prisoner. This guy had been through some stuff. He wasn't exactly just giving a a a a a, a scripted response of how his life was perfect, and he's writing all this, and this is what he writes, beloved. Actually, I, I mistake. He wrote five books. I, I've often forget uh, uh, Revelation. So please, uh, I know someone probably caught that and they were yelling at the screen. He wrote five. And I'm just sitting here and realized I made a mistake. So he wrote the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark. He made Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. Forgive me. See, live TV here, folks. We we don't always get it right. But my point, yeah, so see, that's just the beauty of, uh, of, live, of live, uh, live TV. He wrote five, but this is what he writes. This is 1 John. This is in your notes as well this week. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. This is, this is the context. When we talk about context, this is what he says. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If anyone who does not love, anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Not a big deal, right? Now God is love. Great. You know, God is love. That's what we, we read that like God is love. Hold on. Wait a minute. Stop the press. Get the context of what he just said. He just said God is love. You're like, okay, what's the big deal? No, 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 no. Think about this. This is monumental what he says. God is love. God is love. God is love. He's looking at immense suffering, immense pain, heartache, disappointment, tragedy. And in all of that, he says, God is love. We struggle because one of the things we struggle with is if God is so good, how does he let so much suffering and problems and pain in life happen? And John is looking at all the problems, pain, suffering. And in the midst of that, he pins the words, God is love. And what's even more unique about this is, for us today, it doesn't stand out. But in that time period, this was huge. This is massive. Because this was something so foreign to the, to the, to the first century reader. Because the first century reader didn't know anything about any deity being love. Because their gods were distant, cold, harsh, judging. They weren't described as love. They weren't described. And in the Old Testament, God is described as holy, sovereign. But God's never really described as love. Yeah, there's attributes of love. But John cuts to the chase. He just puts a three-word sentence together that changes the world and changes us today even though we have lost the magnitude of it he says god is love and we continue to read he says god is love in this way the love of god was revealed to us that god sent his only begotten son to the world that we might live through him so that's why we know the true love of god was not explored in the old testament because christ had not come and the sacrifice of the cross had not been given because the greatest greatest picture of love in the history of all mankind was Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. That was love. That was the greatest description of love. And so John puts that back into it. He says, listen, in this way, God revealed his love to us that God sent his only begotten son of the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. I mean, 
I could just read this today and just stop and let the Spirit of God soak in what he's saying here today because they're so it's so massive. In this is love. What is love? Not that we love God. Oh, I love God. No, that's not the, that's not the power of love. It's that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What does the Bible say in Romans? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the greatest part of love is that love came to us first. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Word perfected there is not perfect, it's complete. God's love is not complete in you until it stops coming to you and starts flowing through you. That's what we look at. That's the problem we have. We look at ourselves as the stop. God loves us. No, no, no. God loves through us. Mm, see, you missed it, missed it, missed it. Slow down, stop the press, put the coffee down, put down the pancakes, put your waffle down, don't eat the bacon, don't eat the sausage, stop and hear what I just said. God loves through us. What about God loving me? He does love you as it flows through you. Oh, you're gonna get yours, don't forget. No, no, you're gonna get yours. But that, it's not about God loving you, it's God loving through you. He says this, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected, made perfect or completed in us. How is God's love complete in us? Is that God dwells in us because we love one another. Notice this, if you only have God loving you, you only have half of God's love. If you want the completion of God's love, you've got to stop letting God love you and love through you. You're going to feel God's love. He's going to love on you. But that love is not going to reside in you. It's going to reside through you. And the power of that, which you've heard before, Bishop Wright's taught about this is before, is if you let God love you, you have a container that allows only a certain amount before you can't get any more love. But if you change that container, which is just a, a, a vessel, into a conduit, now there's an unlimited amount of love that can throw, flow through you. So now you went from half of God's love to all of God's love. Why? Because you have loved one for another. It's not that you stopped letting God love you. It's not that God doesn't love you. But now God loves you and through you, which is the completion of love. And this is what John is trying to get us to do here. And God, John is trying to get us to say, but more importantly, don't forget, context is king. John is looking at the church. John is not seeing the church in a future. John is seeing the church in its glory. This is 90 AD or 95 AD in that range. By this point in time, the church has absolutely revolutionized the world. It has reached all the way to the house of Caesar. Now, this was written after Paul's epistles, after Paul had passed away. Peter's gone. The world has been shaken by the church. And Paul's looking at this and going, I got the answer. Do you know why the church had this happen? Because the church had a passion for love and loving God, letting God love them, but letting God love through them. This is what made the church amazing. And then he goes further, verse 13. We know that we live in him and he is in us because he's given us a spirit. I got the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Check. Got it. I got the spirit of God. Great. John says, that's great. Awesome. We know it. We know he lives in us. Why? Because he's in us. Why? Because he gave us a spirit. Okay, great. And we have seen and testified that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. Check. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And we have come to know that and to believe the love that God has for us. Okay, great. Let's get this. This is, this is huge. Love it. So John is trying to build a big picture here because he's, again, he's even building his own context. Listen, we know God's in you, us because we have the spirit of God. We also believe and confess that the father sent the son and the son died for our sins. We've confessed that and believed in it, which in the context of that would be the fact that John was the one that wrote John chapter three, verse uh, five, which says you have to be born of water and the spirit. So how do we believe and confess that Jesus is the son of God and died for our sins? We believe that and confess through obedience to what he 
spoke for us to do. We believe that because we received the spirit and we've been baptized. These are the uh, applications to our belief. Faith without works is dead. So we believe and therefore we act on our belief. It's one thing to say I believe, but another thing to act like I believe. So John's saying, listen, we've got the spirit of God in us and we have believed because we've acted upon that belief because we have obeyed the commands of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He goes back to that same three letter, three word sentence that rocked the world. God is love. I want to remind you, hey, and if we have, if we have come to know and to believe that the love of God has for us, period, God is love. In case you forgot, I'm telling you again, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. I mean, this is, this is wonderful. I love this. I mean, you can't just get beautiful. Then I mean, he says, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Man, this sounds like just this wonderful, just loving you is easy because you're beautiful. I mean, this is just wonderful. Love is flowing everywhere. I mean, love is in the air. John is just writing loves. I mean, when he's writing this, he's got hearts and flowers popping in. He's got Cupid pulling back his bow. I mean, it's just love is in the air, baby. It's love. In this way, God's love is completed or perfected in us so that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Ooh, ooh time out. Ooh, don't, ooh, time. Let's go back for a second, John. Don't like that. Can we go back to the first part? Because you're getting a little squirrely there. We don't talk about judgment in God. God. God's love. No, no. No, he said we love. We have received this love and it's completed in us so that on the day of judgment, we can stand boldly because we know the love of God. If you're afraid of judgment, it's because you don't understand the love of God or you haven't received the love of God. Because as he is, so are we in this world. I mean, I mean John is just dropping truth bombs everywhere. I mean, by this point in time, his mic is so bent up and broken because he's just dropped the mic a thousand times on everything he said. I mean, he's like, we have boldness in the day of judgment. Boom. Oh, because he is, so are we in this world. Boom. Which means I got to strive every day to be like Jesus. Drop the mic. Boom. But he's not done yet. Verse 18, there's no fear in love. What? What is the one thing right now it seems like our world is fascinated by and controlled by? Fear. Put whatever label you want on it. Anxiety, panic, whatever you want to call it. It's fear. Because we have eliminated the love of God. The love of God is the only thing that drives out true fear. Try whatever tactics you want. But the Bible says there's no fear in love. God is love. So there is no fear in God. If I don't have God, I don't have true love that's complete in me. And therefore, I can't really overcome fear. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? Simple math. If God is love and there's no fear in love, then the way to get rid of fear is by God and letting God love me and letting my love be complete in him, which will drive out fear. But well, I have certain I have certain conditions. Fine, keep your conditions, but just try it. See what happens. See what happens. See if God can help you with that. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love, right? What's perfect mean? Complete. What's complete love? God's love in us and through us. So complete love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears is not complete in love. Meaning the part of about it is, is that in our core as a human being, according to what Paul, this is, this is John's writing. Don't, don't throw your psychology book at me yet. Don't, don't, don't turn me off while he doesn't know what he's talking about because this is a real condition that's been medically verified. I'm not talking about the medical part of it. I'm talking about what John's saying. John's saying is that at the core of all fear is the fear of judgment because we are human beings and we know deep down in our core that there is something out there that's bigger than us. Call it God, call it whatever you want to do, whatever you call it, the, 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 the architect of the universe, whatever label someone puts on it, 
in 90% of humans out there today, they have acknowledged the fact there's something bigger. There's a, there's a group of tr people now that have tried to eliminate it. Nothing's out there. We're just, we're a, we're a rock floating in the middle of this abundance amount of the universe. And somehow we just happen to create this world, but it's just all by perfect, exactly the billions and billions and billions of stars out there, but we're the only one rock that figured it out. Come on, man, really, seriously? People are brilliant and they, they you know, the probability of this one rock being the only, the, the, the one rock that figured it out. There's billions of rocks out there, but this is the only rock that figured it out. But bottom line is, John's saying, because there's something in humans, we know that there's something bigger than us. And because there's something bigger than us, we know we're not, we're not, you're not put on this planet to exist. What's the purpose of life? What, what's the meaning of life? You can't find meaning without God. You can't find God without understanding his love. Because the reason why we're even here is because God's love. He wanted to love you and he wanted you to love him back. And he wanted you to be the representation of his love. That's the perfect love. And he says, we, whoever fears is not perfect in love because fear has to do with punishment. We fear because of the ultimate problem we have because we're not complete in his love. That's not me talking. So if you have a fear problem today, you, before you go see the doctor, before you decide what you need to do to overcome that fear, why don't you start with God? Find out what you're really afraid of. Because more importantly, I'm going to say it this way. Oh, here we go. I'm just going to jump right into it. This is not love. We're going to get right into it real quick. At the core of fear, 99% of the time is control. We fear things we can't control. We fear when things are out of control. We fear things we can't understand. We can't see. We don't know. That's why we fear. That's why we fear. We fear. We fear things we can't see. For example, real quickly, let's do this little test. We're, not, we're talking about love here, but this is where the Lord is. I told you sometimes we're never going to get through all this, but that's okay. Let's turn off the lights. Okay. Now I'm still here. You can't see me. I am still here. I'm waving, by the way. I don't know if you can see me. I'm waving. But it's black, complete black. And because I can't see anything, I don't know what's out there. And because what I don't know what's out there, all of a sudden now I start to question What's in this room? Because I can't see it anymore. Turn on, hold on, let me turn the lights back on. Okay, I'm here, I'm back. Now I can see, I'm not afraid anymore because I can see. I can see this computer, I can see the, the camera in front of me, I can see me looking back at me, which has always been weird, but it is what it is, especially with my distraction capabilities, I always see myself, which is hard. But I see me. So if I go back over here real quickly, one more time, and I turn the lights off, I don't see anything because I don't know, I can't control my surroundings anymore. There's an open door for fear. Is there something in this room? Is there a spider? God forbid, is there a snake? Is there something I can't see? One more time, turn the lights on. There you go. Fear, at the most part, for most of us, is based in things we can't control. When you get the diagnosis, of a condition in your body, you suddenly battle fear. Even if you know what it is, you have this going on in your body. Well, you have fear, why? Because you don't know the outcome. Did they catch it in time? Will the medicine work? Can they get it in surgery? It got it right, do I have the right doctor? Things I can't control, things I don't know cause fear. I fear for my future. I fear for my current. The amount of people nowadays that are, are dealing with fear, paralyzed by anxiety. Why? Because when, when things are out of control, we go to control. We control things. We control our world, our surroundings. We try to control things because that's how we combat fear. And God says, you don't combat fear through control. You combat fear through love. Because you know what's amazing? Do this one more time. Turn the lights off. I, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm sitting here now. I can't see a thing. But if I had someone in this room with me that came over and put their hands around me, so listen, look, I've already checked the room. There's nothing in here. Even though you can't see it, I'm right here with you. 
and I've got you. Don't worry. I've already checked the room. And what if they had, how about this? Come back on here because I know sometimes staring at the uh, darkness is weird. They make night vision goggles. You don't need light to see. You can be in pitch black and see with night vision goggles. What if I'm in the pitch black? I can't see. But the person standing next to me who's got their arm around me has night vision goggles. And they're looking around. They're going, yeah, there's nothing in here. Don't worry about it. I got it. How do you know? Because I can see. I can see everything perfect. I have the ability to see what you can't. Oh, somebody hear me in Jesus' name right now. God's trying to help somebody get free right now. I can feel it in the Holy Ghost. God's trying to help someone get free of a bondage of fear that you have been locked in and you've been lied to that that's the way it's going to be. You've tried to do whatever you can to deal with it, to overcome it, to walk your way around it, to figure it out, or to just absolutely just, just, just exist in it. But I'm telling you, God wants to set you free because you're standing there in the dark and you're free. You can't, you don't, you can't control anything. You don't know what it is, but there's a heavenly father standing right next to you who wants to put his arms around you. That's got night vision goggles and says, listen, I can see what you can't see. I can sense what you can't sense. I, I know what's going on. Trust me. I got you. You don't have to be afraid because I've got you. I love you. And I'm going to be in this with you. I'm going to lead and guide you in this. You're going to have to trust me. Yeah. There are going to be times where the lights are off and you can't see. You're going to be, you're not going to see anything. The lights are off. Everything's cut out. But you know what? When you can't see, I can see. Come on, somebody. When you can't see, I can see because I see what you can't see. I can see the future and I can see your past. I can see your present. I can see where you're going. I can see where you're coming from. If you would just trust me. No, you're never going to be able to fully see it because you're living in the darkness. But I'm living in the light. I am light. Notice the Bible says, in God is light. The light came into darkness. Oh, I'm, I'm off. I know. You'll just have to get the notes and follow along the best you know how. Okay, but we're, we're here. The Lord has stopped all this because he's trying to minister to somebody right now who needs to listen to what I'm saying. The Holy Ghost is saying, the Bible says, in in God is light. So what does that mean? Darkness, right? We've got darkness. Darkness is not the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of understanding, knowledge. It creates darkness. Darkness creates fear. Very rarely do you get afraid in bright light. You get afraid in the dark. But the Bible says when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he stepped in light, boom, stepped into darkness. The darkness comprehended it not, but the light came in. When Jesus Christ is in my life, I can walk in the light as he is in the light. Oh, time out. Woo. Time again. I, I got to slow down getting excited. Hallelujah. Praise to Jesus. You got to read this. Wait a minute. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Where is it? We're going to find it real quickly here. Oh, Lord Jesus, you got to get this. John just said that, oh man, Lord Jesus, somebody needs to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying really quickly here. We're going to sum this up real fast because we're going to get to where John said right here. John said it. Ready? Boom. Get this. We're talking about fear, right? Fear, fear, darkness, light, all this together, love. What does this all have to do? John told us. Let's go back to the very beginning. First John chapter one, verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen in our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. The life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and announced to you the eternal life, which was the father revealed to us. We declare to you that which we have seen and heard that you also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and his son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you so that your joy may be complete. Are you ready? Here you go. This then is the message which we have heard and declare to you. God is light. I know I'm supposed to be cool and calm and collect them. I'm just too excited because I can feel the spirit of revelation trying to penetrate to somebody's light. You know what John's saying? He's saying, guess what? God is light. God is light. You're in the darkness, but God is light. You're bound by depression, fear, anxiety, stress, lack of control, confusion, but God is light. He said, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say, now here we go, ready again. This is all coming together. We're landing the plane right beautifully with John. He said, if we, have, if we have fellowship with him, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, 
We lie. We do not practice truth. Meaning, if we say we walk with God, we have fellowship with God, but we're constantly living in fear because we can't see. We're in darkness. We're, we're, we're battling with things we can't control. We're, we're, we're really not telling the truth. We're not walking in truth because God is light. God is light. He said, if we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, but if we walk in the light, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all our sins. You heard me talk about this last year, but I'll break it down for you again. That word fellowship there, one with another, it's not, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Praise the Lord, brother. How are you doing, sister? Oh, how you doing? I'm doing okay. How you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, how's the parents? How's the kids? How's your job? That's not fellowship. The word fellowship there is koinonia. It's a Greek term. That Greek term there is a deep word. It's a shared bond. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's a flowing through, not to us. It's, it's community. It's joint participation. It's deep, close-knit. It's not just I'm on my own and I show up to church to get my Jesus on, but I'm going to go live my own life. It's knowing that I'm a part of the body of Christ. We're in this together, that every one of us matters, that we're all in this together. And when we come together with small group gathering or we're all hanging out at the park, we're not just coming together to shake a few hands and go home, but we're coming together and we're having fellowship. We want deep connection. Why? Because we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one another. And when that happens... The Bible says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. You know what that means? That means if I'm walking in him and I'm walking in fellowship with my brothers and sisters, not just participation, but fellowship. That means I'm not coming around to get. I'm coming around to participate, to join together. I'm going to get my blessing. I'm going to get my praise on. No, no, it's not about you. But when I come together, I'm, I got a whole nother thing I'm going to teach about this, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, that goes along with this. I hate to break it down to you, brother, sister, it ain't about you. You're not coming around to get. You're coming around to participate. Because as you participate, you will get. But you're not getting to get. You're getting because it's a part of the package. But if you come to get, you're not going to get. But if you come to participate, you will get. But you can't come to participate with a wink, wink, because you know you're going to get. you got to come to participate no matter what you get. But it doesn't matter because if you participate, God's going to give you everything you need. And a part of the package, his blood will flow in your life. A part of the package, you're going to feel the forgiveness of jesus christ this is what the church i want to be as bold as say this is this this is what the church the, the the church of today is missing that the church in the beginning had that changed the world we have no true fellowship one with another well, we get together no no that's you're missing it we come to church no 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 you go to small group no 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 we don't understand what that really means we don't understand the revelation of that because he goes on, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word and his word is not in us. We'll continue. Chapter two, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you do not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous as he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our only, but also for the sins of the world. By this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly has the love of God perfected in him. By this, we know we are in him. Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as he walked. What is he talking about? He says, brothers, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. I am writing no new commandment to you, but an old commandment to which you have heard from the beginning. What? beginning not the beginning of genesis the beginning of jesus and what was that commandment john 13 love one another as i have loved you that's the commandment he's talking about right there and when we back all that up it all comes down to this singular thing god is love but god loving through me not just me and in that i can walk in the light as he is in light his truth can be in me i can be made perfect in love 
This is what Paul, John understood that we've missed. This is what John saw that we, didn't, we don't see. This is what the church is needing. So when you go to your small group today, or you go to whatever gathering you're going to go to in the next few today or next week, you're not just showing up to put in your time. You're joining together. You're coming together. There's something greater happening. That's why, no offense, you can't afford to miss coming together. Well, you know, it's not that important. I got God on my own. No, you don't. You have a half of God, but you don't have all of God. Because John said you can't have all of God unless you're in fellowship. And sorry, fellowship is more than just talking on the phone. Yeah, you can do that, but there has to be something deeper than that. There has to be a shared joint, one another. And then we know we have 59 one another commands in the scripture. This is why all this stuff we're talking about is not just silly stuff. Oh, it's just another tangent. No, this is the crux of it all so that we can have koinonia. Why? Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in prayer. What do they say? Continue said in doctrine, in fellowship. That word fellowship is koinonia. That's the same fellowship. Wasn't talking about we're just going to sit around in fellowship. We say, let's have a fellowship. What do we mean? Food, talking. That's not what fellowship means. Can that be a part of it? Sure, but that's not what it means. Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. That's what the early church did. They changed the world upside down. World upside down. We've done all this without that. And look what we've done. We've, we've affected really nobody. Just a handful Those of you that are in fear today, let God change that by his love. Let God set you free today by his love. Stop living in darkness. Live in the light. Live in the light. Let God open so you can see today. In Jesus' name. I pray in the name of Jesus that whatever was said here today has spoken to you, that you've heard the word of God and you mix it with faith, but more importantly, that you take what's being said today and you apply it to whatever level you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ, that you would apply it so that God can work in your life. In Jesus' name. Hopefully those of you that are part of Antioch West will see you in a few minutes at your small group. For the rest of you, God bless you. and. Continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. In Jesus' name.